We have always been um, at the forefront of making sure that uh, Black folks get into the middle class and not yeah. only get into the middle class for their, their families and their communities, but also know that to whom much is given, much is expected. And I think we are seeing that in, in full bloom at this moment. HBCUs are rising in enrollment. Tell me about the explosion and why has this explosion happened? Well, first of all, happy new year, April. Always be good to be, be with, with you. Uh, I think there are a couple of reasons. Uh, one, the talent with respect to uh, black students um, are really taking a look at two things. Not only can I get a quality education, uh, but can I surround myself in a socially conscious way uh, with people and individuals from all backgrounds and abilities um, that think like I think, like I think um, uh, have already aspired to the things that I want to aspire uh, to and can build capacity to not only be exceptional professionals, but be exceptional citizens. A lot of that I think you saw as a result of um, the murder of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor and the resulting uh, effects of that. But I think now, uh, two and a half years uh, from that, uh, you are seeing that once they have taken a look and have experienced the HBCU community again, uh, they are finding that is exactly what we've been telling them uh, it was. Uh, so the, the resurgence at Delaware State has been palpable. We are at about a 33% growth rate over the last five years. And just last year, uh, we oh, year over year, we had a 10% growth rate in that respect. And I think the funding, uh, particularly as it relates to the support we got from the president um, during um, the pandemic and what I think is still left to come, uh, the uh, the loan uh, issue notwithstanding, I think if the Supreme Court does the right thing, that's going to be a big boon for us. The $400 in additional Pell Grant money, uh, which raises the Pell Grant allocation to $7,000 per student, all of that uh, really gives you a sense of what's possible at HBCUs, coupled with the fact that this president, again, more than any other president in United States history, has really focused his efforts and attention in word and deed, not only on HBCUs, but the products of HBCUs. When you look around his cabinet, obviously look at the vice president, and you build capacity uh, for the long term. So I think we are in good stead for a long time to come. It's not just the vice president who everyone loves to say H-U, you know, but it's also, you know, when Cedric Richmond was there, Morehouse, the yeah. house. Um, it was the EPA also dir the EPA director. There are so, so many. So EPA many. director. Let's talk about um, Cedric Richmond. Let's talk about James Clyburn. Let's talk about Benny Thompson, the man who really could be uh, quintessential, the piece to put Donald Trump um, in the eye of the storm for the Department of Justice. Mm -hmm. Tugaloo, you've got so many people who are now leaders in this nation. It used to be Ivy Leagues. The Ivy Leagues were the ones that were supposed to change the status quo. It is flipped. It's now HBCUers. And also let's bring in Beyonce. She did that big homecoming. Oh, no question. no question. Yeah, a lot of people love that. She put it was like the, she in many ways, she was kind of the forerunner uh, to what was to come. Uh, with respect to uh, how the president and the vice president have built this capacity um, for us. And, uh, and I see really this not being a moment. You know, I've talked about it two years ago. I was saying this is a moment or a movement. I actually <laughs> believe it is a movement. And it's not one, as you well know, as a Morgan State alum, um, that has just sprung. Uh, we have <laughs> always been um, at the forefront of making sure that uh, Black folks get into the middle class and not yeah. only get into the middle class for their, their families and their communities, but also know that to whom much is given, much is expected. And I think we are seeing that in, in full bloom at this moment. So with all of this, with this excitement, I'm excited that so many people are finding this renaissance in HBCUs. Mm -hmm. um, we've always been here over 150 years old, almost 200. Many of the schools were born out of slavery it is Mission College, Baptist Colleges um, to give the slaves basic um, education, like basics in reading and writing and arithmetic. But it has grown. And as it's grown in 2023, we're hearing the excitement about the enrollment. But with that is a drawback. Um, infrastructure, primarily housing. Um, mm -hmm. 
we know, uh, and that's the piece. A lot of campuses are excited. They're touting all of these new numbers, higher numbers than they've ever had enrollment before. Incoming freshmen are like just exploding. But with that explosion and with that excitement, the question is how do we uh, house these young people? How do we house, and people, everyone is wanting an on-campus experience, especially since COVID. How is the president's HBCU initiative dealing with this renaissance and then this headbutt of where do we place these children? Yeah, it's a great question. Remember at the president's board of advisors, we have four uh, main objectives. And I should say that that board of advisors is eclectic. It's not just HBC presidents. There are C-suite executives at that table, Tassanda Duckett, uh, TIA, Brett Hart of United Airlines, certainly some HBCU executives, and then some subject matter experts ahead of Nesby, et cetera. Four priorities, and I'll, I'll go through them quickly. One, infrastructure, both physical and technological. So it's not only about housing our students on campus, but making sure they can do their work in a contemporary America. Uh, the second one is building capacity for our research infrastructure. We already know, to your point, that we can provide uh, quality education. We need not only our living spaces um, to look like that quality education, but also our learning spaces um, to look at, like that quality education. The third is connected pathways for internships and employment. And the fourth is HBCU preservation and growth. To your specific question about infrastructure, uh, Congresswoman Alma Adams has been a stalwart um, in her work around HBCU Ignite. Um, out at 118th Congress, we got another $50 million um, on that score. That is just the beginning, um, certainly not the end, but she's been very specific about making sure that we can get federal funding um, that supports our infrastructure, both in a learning spaces and living spaces. And as I've said, the president who I've known for a long time, understand his clear commitment. He was just at Dell State in October. Um, he understands that the steps he's taken now are the first steps, not the final steps. So continuing to build capacity uh, for support, not only from the federal government, by the way, but also uh, linking uh, to corporate America and making sure that they are stepping up, which happened to us at Delaware State. We actually got a donation of a 30,000 um, square foot facility in pristine condition right on the Wilmington Riverfront from Capital One um, just a year ago. And they use HBCU Ignite, which is Congresswoman Adams' bill, as a sample of what could be done and should be done across the HBCU landscape. So I'm pretty bullish about what's possible here. Uh, we said we need to make sure we're continuing to keep the pressure on. So a couple of things. What was the jump in your um, enrollment? So two things at Delaware State, and I think that are important. Uh, one uh, is we have been fighting probably for 10 years now uh, for what we call the Inspire Scholarship. The Inspire Scholarship effectively says if you are a graduating high school senior, regardless of background or experience, have a 2.75 and commit to public service while you're at Dell State, the, the state of Delaware will pay full tuition for four years at the university. So in 10 years ago, we got that for two years. Four years ago, we had that for three years. Today, we now have it full four-year tuition-free scholarship. So that's been a big boost for us. I, I can tell you that not only um, are we the fastest growing HBCU in the nation at the moment, this is the first time in Delaware that Delaware students of color, their first choice uh, for universities are Delaware State University. So it makes us really, really proud in that regard. The other thing I'd say is pipeline. And I know you know all about this. It's about when you start getting students ready for the college experience. So we have an early college high school at Delaware State where you can actually earn up to 60 college credits before you're ever admitted into any college. And uh, we have about 425 students in our high school, 200 in our middle school, and about 56% of them come to Delaware State and 94% of them go to colleges across the country. So building capacity um, like that, both talent pipelining and unique opportunities uh, with state partnerships that you're seeing in other HBCU uh, states, uh, Maryland's one example, uh, Tennessee is another example, I think will build capacity for us all over the long term. So, okay, so, okay, but are you, you're not, are you facing this jump in, um, try, this jump in enrollment that's causing a housing problem with you? Are you having that, like, Morgan, 
Tennessee State, um, Fisk. I've heard of um, North Carolina a and Are you one of those two or not? N- not now, but I can tell you um, that four years ago, we had the same problem, which is to say that we needed to uh, create deals with hotels right along the highway um, to make sure that we had capacity uh, for our growing enrollment. As, as you know, we were able to aqu- acquire a small private liberal arts college uh, right down the road here that has given us additional capacity on that score. But trust me, uh, we understand the pain of our sister institutions and are continuing to promote uh, more infrastructure funding uh, for all of us. So this is a short-term and a long-term problem. Yes. And if there is an expansion of building for housing on these university campuses, the problem is you're going to have to keep, you're going to have to raise enrollment to be able to sustain the new buildings to accommodate the new enrollment. Um, Do you find that a double-edged sword in a way? Because if you build, you've got to continue to have that capacity. No. And the reason I'd say no is because the way you think about edu- higher education in the 21st century America is what is your student portfolio mix, right? So yes, everybody, I would say generally everybody, at least the institutions I work with closely need more housing um, space. But the student portfolio mix is important. The online opportunity for HBCUs across the country is enormous. So there are 500,000 500, black online learners in the country. Only 20,000 of them are using their online education at an HBCU. So we have a unique opportunity as an HBCU community to build capacity for more online offerings. What does that do? That decreases your need uh, for housing. It actually puts you in a different space for um, um, online learners who are mid-career professionals, which is a real um, important opportunity as well. So my sense is, as you think about your student portfolio mix, uh, if we get the right number as to what we need residentially and build capacity in the online community, and I might say internationally too, which is a unique opportunity, particularly in the African diaspora, um, we should be fine. But we have to be thinking holistically about how we're building our student portfolio. And that's interesting. You said that Tom Joyner was trying to do that big HBCU online. Remember that? I do. Yes. Joyner was trying to do that. So what schools can you tell me? I know Morgan, uh, Tennessee State, um, I think Morehouse is having something going on. They've even expanded a little bit. I'm hearing uh, North Carolina Anti. I heard Fisk is even looking at tiny houses. Um, someone is trying to do storage. And, oh, I think the tiny houses and the storage facilities for Fisk. And I was like, wow, what other schools are you hearing about that are, that are having this explosion? Oh, I, I think you mentioned uh, the ones that I would mention to you. I mean, I can talk to you even about Howard, obviously, which shouldn't be surprising to you. But Howard is a whole- uh, That's they, true. Yeah, that's true. It's, do you include them? Because they got their own unique problems of anyway. No, I do. I, I do. I, you know, from, from my standpoint, um, all of our HBCUs, when we win, when one of us win, we all win. When we lose, all of us lose. And I, my a big example for you is I'm spending a lot of time at Cheney University right now. Uh, which is going through a tough slog, uh, but have a great president in place, was one of very few, I believe, uh, two Pennsylvania schools that actually grew this year. Um, So, and, you know, the capacity relative to how they're uh, transforming uh, their university and preparing for their students, I think is unique as well. So you mentioned a lot that I would mention, but I think across the landscape, First of all, the enrollment growth is uneven. So I don't want everybody to think that um, enrollment is exploding across the HBCU landscape. Uh, But I think the the ones that are kind of middle uh, portfolio, think about as 5,000 to 7,500 and then 7,500 and up have seen a significant explosion. And then the others, I think, are are having a more moderate effect on that regard. But we all have to be prepared because my sense is more of uh, the HBC renaissance, if you will, will come to more schools and more students in those communities will pick those HBCUs as a result.